Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this season. Father, it's a reminder to us that you, above all things, care about us, for us. And Father, as we go through your word today, uh, Lord, help us to understand, help us to receive. Father, help us have the courage to look at what your word says and to reflect upon it and act upon it. Father, let the words that I speak, Lord, just be ordained by you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, the Christmas story, here we are. We're in the middle of it. We, um, we got our Christmas tree yesterday. That was step number one without any great adventure. I'm um, pretty happy to do it. But the Christmas story, you know, we all know it. We've all heard it. We've all lived it. Um, and it's just been a part of, of our culture. And this morning we want to emphasize more than anything else that it's true. Above all things, the Christmas story is true. Whatever you think about Christianity, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's, it's all there. As Christians, we have to understand and recognize we've made a lot of mistakes. We really have. We need to own that. But above and beyond all that, the story is true. And time and eternity will prove once and for all that not just this story is true, but every story in this book is true. In fact, I, you could almost say that there's probably not a life story in this building this morning that's not somewhere in these pages. It is that, it is that, and think of a word. It, has, it contains everything. It's a reminder. Christmas is a reminder that the supernatural will never be understood by the natural. It's kind of a reminder that in many ways God doesn't make sense. It's a reminder that in many ways God's not going to fit in. It, it's bigger and beyond what we can think. It's a reminder that as, as much as this book gives us this great living document on how to live a healthy, emotional, stable life, that besides that, you have, we have to add this thing called faith, that thing that's really hard to define. And the Christmas story kind of requires that to understand it, that we need faith to believe in something that's bigger than us, to believe in something that we may never fully understand, and that's okay. But at some point, we need to cross that invisible line called faith. Otherwise, we, it's like living on the outside in a cold, snowy night, looking, looking through the window at a warm fire. It looks great. It, it, you can almost feel the warmth of it. But until we cross that line of faith, we're always on that outside looking through that window of Scripture. This morning, we're going to look at two very extreme lives in the book of Luke. Two lives that in many ways may not make sense or even be accepted in our church today. The first extreme is an old, old, an old elderly couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth. It's a couple that they hold on to these religious traditions and sacraments and rituals from thousands, thousands of years ago, and they're stuck on it. They, they, they define what we would say was legalism today. They are so religious, it's beyond comprehension. If they're in our church today, it would be, be a questionable thing that this, the religious practices they that they endeavor to do. And then on the other extreme is this teenager by the name of Mary. Theologians feel that she may be as young as 12 years old, 13. She's engaged to be married, to be married, and she walks in the door and she's pregnant. That's not really a big deal, actually. In fact, in today's culture, in fact, if you 
I, I know that our church would welcome that. We would minister to that. We would help that. We would say, how can we, how can we get our hands dirty in that? Until we hear her story that she's a virgin. And now we have a little bit of a problem with that. And then we go a little bit deep when we find out that she's not just a virgin, but she heard all these voices voices of angels that gave her this story that she's now telling us and all of a sudden we would find this rightfully so very awkward hard to believe never happened it's never happened in the history of mankind it may be the only miracle in the bible that's not found in the old testament or the new it's a standalone so this morning we're going to look at we're going to look at that as we're going to walk into this we're going to start in in luke chapter one um, and we're going to start off because it's such an incredible story. We're going to start off in, in, in verses one through four. Luke's making a very interesting statement, and it should be on the, on the screen. In Luke chapter one, one through four, the credibility of the Christmas story. I'm waiting for my screen person. Luke starts off and says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an early account for you most excellent Theophilus, so you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. This is the very beginning of the New Testament. Theologians and historians say that it has been four, 400 years since God has really been, has shown up. 400 years, they call it 400 years of silence. And Luke starts off and, he, he, and, he, and, he, and he, he directs something that's very important to the non-Christian and Christian, the credibility of what's being written. You know, I remember before I became a Christian, I always wondered, like, who wrote the Bible? Where'd they get their facts from? Who were they? Why did, you know, and, and I think it's a very fair question. And I think it's important that Luke starts off and he says, these things have been fulfilled among us. The things that, the things that you're, I'm going to tell you this morning, the things in the Bible, is a fulfillment of those things that were told to the Jewish people. Most theologians agree there's over 600 and some prophecies about the Messiah. Many of these prophecies were about his birth. And Luke is saying, that which were you were told, you were told and you were told, this is that, that's being fulfilled today. This is not something that's not been written about. And then he goes on and he says, the evidence, the evidence of what we're going to say is based on eyewitnesses and ministers. There's eyewitnesses to what happened here. It didn't happen in the dark and somebody walked out and said, hey, guess what? There were eyewitnesses. There were ministers of the word that took us into account. And then he goes on in the, to the next step and he says, I have carefully investigated. I took care. I invested like a detective. I looked at the facts. I looked at the details, looked at everything. In the King James, it says, he goes so far in the King James says, I had perfect understanding of this story I'm going to tell you this morning. Perfect, no doubt about it. There's no what ifs about it. There's no second guessing. There's no other, there's nobody else that's going to say it didn't happen. There's no other emotional, psychological explanation of something mystical that we can't explain. Luke, who was a doctor, a physician, an educated man, I carefully investigated and I had perfect understanding of this account. 
Then the very last thing is he writes to his friend that he's writing to. He says at the very end, that you may know the, the certainty of the things you've been taught, that you may know the certainty of this story. That after you hear this story, that you can be confident it happened. And I think what's so important why I'm pointing this all out is because the story we're about to tell you, in fairness, it's hard to believe. It's really hard to believe. And if two people came in, if Zacharias and Elizabeth came in and Mary walked in the doors of this church and told us what we're going to read today, we would probably call for the elders of the church. Right? I could, see, I could just see our host team trying to deal with this one. Right? Get the elders. The elders come in. Get the pastor. Pastor comes in. It's that. But yet, you know something about Christmas? We allow our imagination to accept the things our mind doesn't understand. Right? Isn't that the, isn't that the faith of a child? They allow their imagination to accept that thing which the mind can't comprehend. The sad thing, when we all go back to work, we let, we let that thing slip by, don't we? And we slip back into the, the, the reality that get, gets away from us. So who are, who is Zacharias and Elizabeth? So we're going to read about them and kind of break this thing down. It's kind of interesting. They were a very religious couple. Now, I be careful I say this so I don't insult somebody. Uh, there is probably nothing more insulting to a Christian than to be called religious. In a way, you know what I mean? It's like I remember as a Christian, because it, it, it kind of, I'm a Christian. I don't want to be called religious. It has something about the idea of being religious it bothers us. You know, it's like, that's outdated. Don't be religious. Are you kidding me? That is just so old school. And you'll never fit in. Don't do that. It's like, it's like, it's like you'd almost rather have typhoid, typhoid fever than be religious. You know, it had that kind of a, and it speaks of rituals and sacraments and and, and sacrifices and, and routine and routine and routine. We're not like that. We're Christians. I remember in the, in the 80s, the big thing in the charismatic church, we've been set free. We've been set free. and We don't want to be labeled that. We're doing something better. But this is interesting. And let's, let's read about this couple because um, I think there's something here for us that's going to uh, be important. Starting in uh, Luke 1, verse, we're going to read verse 5 through 10. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abaha. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Verse 6, and I hope you're reading along with this. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. There's over 600 laws that's being followed here, blameless. Sometimes that's interpreted as the reality is they were sincere in their pursuit of God. They were sincere in their pursuit of God. In one way, we say we admire that. But deep down, we probably think that's a pretty boring couple. Right? I mean, if you came home from a week of hard work, hard work, and you walk in and your wife says, we're going to have dinner with Zacharias and Elizabeth. That is probably the last thing you want to do on a Friday night is go see these two. You're probably saying, look, I'm going to go pick up dog poop in the neighborhood. You have fun. 
You know, that is the most, are you kidding me? I've got to hear about this religious old couple, right? But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was a, in verse 9, while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple. And just every part of this speaks to the religious rituals and sacraments of a religious person. But it's interesting. Number one, they're honoring their religious heritage. And we all have a heritage that needs to be honored. We have teenagers and children in this church that their parents have a heritage that the children, they want to respect that, to honor it. To, to understand it. Elizabeth, the things that Elizabeth and, and Zacharias were doing went back thousands and thousands of years ago. Elizabeth was of the heritage of Aaron, the priesthood. Zacharias was, a, was of the tribe of Levi because all the way back into Leviticus chapter 10. In fact, when, when their son was born, the angel told them, your son will neither drink wine nor strong drink. That comes directly out of Leviticus 10 for the order of, the, of those under Aaron, the priest. So everything, their heritage is very deep, very, very deep, generation after generation after generation. This family did nothing but serve God. And here they are thousands of years later, God hasn't spoken in 400 years. I'm sure there was evangelical Jews that were probably saying, 400 years, give it up. Are you kidding me? This, I'm sure there was a Herman in the group, you know? There, there has to be a good Jew in there that's, that's stirring it up. Why are you doing that? You're, you're, you're killing the church. All these rituals you're doing. according to the custom of the priesthood. In the order of his division, he was following his religious order. This is kind of interesting. That he was serving in his division. This goes back to King David. And King David, he had 24 priests that had responsibilities. He set this, this order up and these 24 priests would rotate throughout the year. There was an order to what was going on. There was a schedule. There was a structure. We would never do that as Christians. We know better. But we do have planning center. Shh. And we have this calendar for the whole year. We had a meeting in the staff meeting. We have all of 2020 planned in order and structured. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> You're not supposed to know that. There's order here. It's okay, you know. On a, on a smaller scale, we have an order to our service. In fact, in the Old Testament, there was a very distinct order to worship that once was violated and there was a severe punishment for breaking the order of the worship. But we always have a song, a dismissal, three or four songs. Sometimes we get out of order and go to five. Then we have a video. That's an order. It's, it's okay. It's all right. That's, he, this is the order that was structured being in, in, introduced. And he observed customs in verse nine according to the custom of the priesthood. The custom was twice a day they burned incense. And I, I, I assume they were burning incense for 400 years. Right? I mean, morning and night, they burn incense. They burn incense. And they had these 24 priests. They burn incense and burn. It was a custom. It was a religious custom. And we have customs today. 
We have baptisms, we have communion, we have things we do that we just do out of customs. Um, in a, um, but they have meaning. These things are done because they have meaning. Now, you can look upon it as being religious and not being free to flow in the spirit. But there's reasons for customs and orders and, and honoring your heritage. And so, before we get too carried away, let's see what happened as a result of this. In verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. That is so interesting. An older couple, and the first thing he says, we heard your prayer. We heard it. And you've been faithful over all these years. You've been faithful to come. You've been faithful to serve. Your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You call his name John. And then the angel goes on. This is interesting. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. And that's the heartbeat of every parent, right? That your son or your daughter would serve the Lord. And then he goes even further. Shall neither drink wine nor strong drink. Now we could spend three hours arguing about this in the church. But all that to say, I think what's being said here, your son, he's not just going to serve the Lord. He's not going to compromise in any part of it. He's going to be strong. He's not going to compromise. He's not going to get caught up in all the moral issues and, and, and get in all the things. He's going to be strong. He's going to be black and white when it comes to serving the Lord. And then it goes one step further. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Unprecedented. Never happened before. This is the first. I wonder if Zacharias understood what that really meant. Because 2,000 years later, I don't think we do. I bet, I bet if you ask five pastors what that meant, you'd probably get seven different answers. It's called seminary, I think. But... So what is being said here, the the point I'm trying to make here is, and I think this is what applies, our religious practices can put us in position to experience God. We don't think of it that way, but there's a truth there. Our religious practices can put us in a place to experience God. And we need that. We, we need to experience God. We need to experience the wisdom of God. We need to experience the love of God. We need to experience the heartbeat of a father who is different than any father on earth. We need to experience the love of the one who made us. And here's how, here's, I was just thinking about it as I was, I was preparing for this. This may be as simple as just coming to church every Sunday. It may be as simple as preparing on Saturday night to come on Sunday morning. It may be as simple as being on time. It may be as simple as when it's time to worship, to, to, with an effort to worship. And be... Underneath all this is the attitude of the heart, right? I think beneath Zacharias was an attitude of this, of this idea of a sincere pursuit of God. Rather than walking in the door and, and, and someone asks, you to stand, asks us to stand to worship, and, and how many times we, we have the attitude, you're not telling me what to do. 
I'll do what I do when I plan on doing it, and I'll worship the way I want to worship when I want to worship, blah, 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 blah. Rather than just show respect for the fact that we walk in at 10 o'clock, there have been people here since 6.30 preparing what we enjoy. There have been people preparing all week to put in endless, endless hours of sacrifice to prepare what we enjoy. And, it, and what is it? Just to honor and respect that by doing some simple things. And in the end, I think what I'm trying to say is that although it may seem like a small thing or a religious thing or whatever, that there's an experience we can have with God in that that's unique and special. So, but we have a little problem is we go from religion to reality. And the reality is when Zacharias had this experience, I'm going to read it in verse 18 through 20. I'm going to read what Zacharias said. And it's kind of interesting. And I'm going to read out of what the, the Weist New Testament. It might be a little bit different than what you have in front of you. But it really points something out that I want to emphasize. In Luke Chapter 1, 18 through 20. Zacharias responds and he says, in accordance with what fact will I know this? For as for myself, I am an aged man and my wife is advanced in her years. And the angel answered, said to him, as for myself, <laughs> I love this. You know, I, I, I just been, I've been in Bible studies where we're going through scripture and people say, well, the way I am. And it's like, I'm, I'm thinking, number one, I didn't ask. Number two, I really don't care. And then they go on for 10 minutes. He's like, that's what that picture I got. Zachariah said, ask for myself. And I just, and I just Gabriel, Gabriel must have laughed, you know. It's like, who is this guy? As for myself. And he responds and says, as for myself, I stand before God. What do you think? What do you think with that, Zach? You know? <laughs> Who stands in the presence of God and I was sent on a mission to speak to you and bring you good tidings of these things. Now, to really understand this, we now need to jump over it's a comparison. We need to jump over to Mary because it's very, and, and it's going to be a lengthy read. I, I apologize if right up front, uh, but it's, it's important. So we're going to go jump to Luke 1, and I'm going to read verse 26 through 38. And what I want you to notice as we read through this is the similarity. It's, it's almost like verbatim, some of these things. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel, Gab I have a daughter named Gabrielle, so it's just really, it get really, it's really hard. You know. Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, in verse 28, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Now, she hadn't said anything yet. She's just thinking. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. She call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. In verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. 
Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And it's now in her sixth month for her, for her who is called barren. Verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. Some comparison. Zacharias spent his whole life serving the Lord. Zacharias had a model for him, Father Abraham, whose wife also was older, aged, and could not have children. And God performed the same miracle. So Zacharias has been praying for this miracle, even though they were old, had this model before him, it the angel comes and says this to him, it's going to happen. And he goes off and says, well, for myself, and my, my wife is too old, blah, 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 blah. Mary didn't ask for this. She didn't ask for it. Teenager. It had never been, there's no model for this. It had never happened before. She was asked to do more than just the impossible. She was asked to do that which had never been done before. A lot of times we ask for things that we think are impossible, but we have a model that shows us it's been done before. We can look out through the church and through our friends and family and we say, look what God has done. Mary didn't have that. Mary couldn't back, go, go back to Leviticus or, or, or Deuteronomy or David or or, or Isaiah and say, well, he, she, hey, it's happened before. She didn't have that. And, uh, and, and she got, why would I want it? I, I'm not even married. It's a pretty fair question she's asking. So it's interesting. What was missing in Zechariah is fulfilled in Mary. Zechariah is this old, represents the Old Testament and doesn't understand and believe. And Mary is this New Testament example that says, according to your word, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to do it. I'll accept it. So, in short, here's what Zechariah, number one, focused more on himself and his circumstances than the word. He focused on himself. And honestly, uh, we do this, right? Right? It's, it's, it's no, look, look, there's no shame here. We, we all do it. As an, uh, as an elder, I do it. All the elders, the pastor, every pastor in Loudoun County, we, it's, so it's, it's natural to, to think that their circumstances are bigger than God. It's natural to think, well, wait a minute, I can't, I don't, how about, I can't do this. On the other hand, Mary focused more on the word that was given to her than her circumstances. You know, I, I always, I'm, because I'm old, I think different things like this. I, I, what am I thinking? I wonder what it looked like in heaven the next day when, Gabriel went up and said, man, I gave, I gave Zacharias a message and that guy just wouldn't shut up. He, he knows the scripture. He knows, what, he knows all these things and he's blabbing on. I think the guy's dumb, you know? <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> he was dumb. But I, I wonder what he thought about Mary, though. I told her things that I don't know if I believed. I wonder if the angel, you know what I mean? There are certain things that angels don't understand. Being born again. They haven't, they don't, that's the whole, I wonder if the, there's a place here in my brain that's, that, that, that the angel's thinking, I, I'm not sure I get it, but she got it. A teenager. You know, we have parents in here of teenagers. Let me just give you a better example. It's like you waking up one morning, going down for breakfast, and your teenage daughter has made 
breakfast. And she's in a good mood. And she's dressed appropriately to go to school. And then you look over and she's put dinner in the crock pot for you for when you get home. And you're thinking, I don't even believe this. He ended up trying to put it in 2020 terms, you know? Philip Yancey wrote in his book, the Jesus, the Jesus I Never Knew. He said, quote, often a work of God comes with two edges, great joy and great pain. Mary embraced both in her response. Mary was the first person to accept Jesus on his terms, regardless of the cost. Interesting, Mary. Pregnancy, I was thinking of it as I wrote my own notes. Pregnancy may be the most supernatural, yet natural act the world will ever know. Pregnancy has the ability to produce life. It's a mystery. My dad was an obstetrician in the 1950s, 1960s. He delivered, they did a big article on him in the Philadelphia Inquirer when he passed away. He delivered over 3,000 3, to 5,000 babies. Now back then, you'd get a phone call. He would go to the house, deliver the baby, drive back, and they gave him money for gas. This is, he was an old school doctor. And I remember when we'd talk and after, after his career was over, he retired, and he said, you know, I still don't understand where the breath comes from, where life comes from. 3,000 babies being born, a miracle of nature. He, God, where's the life come from? It's a supernatural thing. It's supernatural. What Mary was saying without knowing it, when accepting the Son of God delivering her most innermost being, she was saying, I will allow you to place your Son, not just as a physical representation of the most intimate form of relationship between two people, between a man and a woman, but also as a symbolic representation of the most spiritual, intimate act of heaven into a man's innermost being. Bible says that life's in the blood. That in pregnancy, Mary shared her life with the Son of God through the umbilical cord. It's, a, it's God did something here. It, Mary shared her most innermost, her life through the blood. And the Bible says a life is in the blood, in the womb. And it's a picture of when a, of when a person asks Jesus Christ in their life, God does something that we don't understand. I have been a Christian for 45 years. I have no clue how this works. But I know that when I asked Jesus to come into my life, Something happened so deep within me that it changed. I literally, physically viewed life differently. It's like someone took my glasses and threw them away and gave me a new set. And it was different. I, it's, it's, it's a miracle. You say, well, can you explain it? No. This can only be experienced. It was designed that way. And it's great to have questions. It's, it's okay to, <clears throat> look, it's okay to say, I don't, I don't understand. It's okay to say, I, don't, I just don't believe it. I, that's fair. You could look at what's being said this morning and walk out here and say, I just don't believe it. And I couldn't argue with you. But once you walk through this door called faith, it all changes. And all of a sudden, even though it's hard to believe, there's something inside of me that says, oh yeah, this is real. 
Something happened. So what, in the end, what is his desire for us today? What is God's desire? What is, the Chris, what is part of the Christmas message for us today? And the band can get ready to come up. I think, that, I think the statement that was made to Mary is true today. In verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you and the Holy One is to be born to you. And I think that statement is still true today. I think God is saying, the Holy Spirit wants to come upon us. He desires to come upon us. The power of the highest wants to overshadow us, overshadow your marriage, your home, overshadow your children, overshadow your business, overshadow your decisions. God, it's, he had that same desire is still true today. <clears throat> he wants to come upon us. He wants to overshadow us. And he wants to be born in us. He wants to be, it's such an odd thing, he wants to be born in us. And yeah, so that's I, 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 that's the thing today. And, and and what did Mary say? Mary's response to what she didn't understand. Mary's response to what had never happened before in the world. Mary's response to something that was so far fetched. A twelve-year-old girl says, stands up and says, "Let it be to me, according to that word." Yes, yes. That's powerful. Father, this morning, as we go through this Christmas season, as we hear the the hymns, as we hear the Christmas carols, as we hear the Christmas story from many angles and from very references, that somewhere in all of this, that we would have the, the courage. Let your word, let it be according to your word in me that I would experience you. Lord, let your word come alive in my heart. All the walls and all the barriers that I've put up, all the reasoning and all the doubts and all the fears and all the, that those walls would come crashing down that the Son of God would be born in us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.